Hello, this is the last reading from this assignment. I'm going to be reading um, The Fall of Troy. First, we're going to go over some vocabulary. I'm going to warn you, there's a spoiler alert in the vocabulary, but I think you're going to be okay. You've probably heard this story before. You may not realize it. But we now have the Greeks and the Trojans fighting over fair Helen. We're going to find out who wins. The title kind of gives it away. But here's some vocabulary you're going to want to know. Hard pressed in this context means under pressure or stress. Gallant means brave. Swift means fast. And an urn is a vase used to hold the ashes of dead person. And it usually is um, like a heavy clay and has a lid on it. A stratagem is a plan to win. Usually has like some serious thought in it. Like it's a cunning plan. It's a tricky plan to win. An unexpected plan. Strike camp means to take down the camp, to pack it away. Exalted means celebrated. Henceforth is, means from now on. And hesitation means waiting. Stole means snuck out. Vanquished is defeated. They're the losers. The vanquished people are the losers. Born down means weighed down. Herald is a messenger, and broken means interrupted. So, just to put, give you a visual about what's going to happen, this is the picture of the Trojan horse. That's what it's called, the Trojan horse. But I think sometimes the name Trojan horse. We have to remember that it was Trojan because it was in the city of Troy. Okay, the Trojans pushed it into their city and the horse was filled with the Greeks. So as we read, and especially as we read the battles, let's remember that the Trojans are in the city. They're the people who live in the city and the Greeks are the people in the horse. The fall of Troy. The greater part of this story comes from Virgil. The capture of Troy is the subject of the second book of the Aenid, and it is one of the best, if not the best story Virgil ever told. Concise, pointed, vivid. The beginning and the end of my account are not in Virgil. The end, the tale of what happened to the Trojan Roman poets. Ah, I, let me go back. The end, the tale of what happened to the Trojan women when Troy fell, comes from a play by Sophocles, his fellow playwright Euripide. To Virgil, as all Roman poets, war was the noblest and most glorious of human activities. 400 years before Virgil, a Greek poet looked at it differently. What was the end of that far-famed war? Euripides seems to ask. Just this, a ruined town, a dead baby, and a few wretched women. With Hector dead, Achilles knew, as his mother had told him, that his own death was near. One more great feat of arms he did before fighting ended his before his fighting ended forever. Prince Memnon of Ethiopia, the son of the goddess of the dawn, came to the assistance of Troy with a large army, and for a time, even though Hector was gone, the Greeks were hard pressed and lost many a gallant warrior, including swift footed Antiochus, old Nestor's son. Finally, Achilles killed Memnon in a glorious combat, the Greek hero's last battle. Then he himself fell beside the Scaean gates. He had driven the Trojans before him up to the wall of Troy. There, Paris shot an arrow at him, and Apollo guided it so that it struck his foot in the one spot where he could be wounded, his heel. His mother, Thetis, when he was born, had intended to make him invulnerable by dipping him into the river Styx, but she was careless and did not see to it that the water covered the part of the foot by which she was holding him. He died, and Ajax carried his body out of the battle while Odysseus held the Trojans back. It is said that after he had been burned on the funeral pyre, his bones were placed in the same urn that held those of his friend Patroclus. They saw clearly by now that unless they could get their army into the city and take the Trojans by surprise, they would never conquer. 
Almost 10 years had passed since they had first laid siege to the grant, to the town, and it seemed as strong as ever. The walls stood uninjured. They had never suffered a real attack. The fighting had taken place, for the most part, at a distance from them. The Greeks must find a secret way of entering the city or accept defeat. The result of this new determination and new vision was the stratagem of the wooden horse. It was, as anyone would guess, the creation of Odysseus's wily mind. Wily is, means creative. He had a skillful worker in wood make a huge wooden horse, which was hollow and so big that it could hold a number of men. The implication is a large number of men. When he persuaded, when he then he persuaded, and had a great chieftain deal of difficulty. I'm going to start over. Then he persuaded and had a great deal of difficulty in doing so. Certain of the chieftains to hide inside it, along with himself, of course. They were all terror stricken except Achilles' son, Napoltimus. And indeed, what they faced was no slight danger. The idea was that all the other Greeks should strike camp and apparently put out to sea. But they would really hide beyond the nearest island where they could not be seen by the Trojans. Whatever happened, they would be safe. They could sail home if anything went wrong. But in that case, the men inside the wooden horse would surely die. Odysseus, as can be readily believed, had not overlooked this fact. His plan was to leave a single Greek behind in the deserted camp, primed, were prepared with a tale calculated to make the Trojans draw the horse into the city and without investigating it. Then, when night was darkest, the Greeks inside were to leave their wooden prison and open the city gates to the army, which by that time would have sailed back and be waiting before the wall. A night came when the plan was carried out. Then, the last day of Troy was dawned. On the wall, the Trojan watchers saw with astonishment two sights, each as startling as the other. In front of the Scaean gates stood an enormous figure of a horse, such a thing as no one had ever seen, an apparition so strange that it was vaguely terrifying, even though there was no sound or movement coming from it. No sound or movement any was anywhere indeed. The noisy Greek camp was hushed, nothing was stirring there, and the ships were gone. Only one conclusion seemed possible, the Greeks had given up. They had sailed for Greece, they had accepted their defeat. All Troy exulted, her long warfare was over, her sufferings lay behind her. The people flocked to the abandoned Greek camp to see the sights. Here Achilles had sulked or pouted so long, there, Agnemon Mum's tent had stood. This was the quarters of the trickster, Odysseus. What rapture, joy, to see the places empty, nothing in them, to fear. At last they drifted back to where that monstrosity, the wooden horse, stood, and they gathered around it, puzzled what to do with it. Then the Greek who had been left behind in the camp discovered himself to them. Means he, like, revealed himself. His name was Sinon, and he was a most plausible or believable speaker. He was seized and dragged to Priam, weeping and protesting that he no longer wished to be a Greek. It was a good tale, and the Trojans never questioned it. They pitied Sinon and assured him that he should henceforth live as one of themselves. So it befell that by false cunning and pretended tears, those who were conquered whom the great Diomedes had never overcome, nor savage Achilles, nor ten years of warfare, nor a thousand ships. For Sinon did not forget the second part of his story. The wooden horse had been made, he said, as a votive offering to Athena, and the reason for its immense size was to discourage the Trojans from taking it into the city. What the Greeks hoped for was that the Trojans would destroy it and so draw down upon them Athena's anger. 
placed in the city, it would turn her favor to them and away from the Greeks. The story was clever enough to the story was clever enough to have had by itself in all probability the desired effect. But Poseidon, the most bitter of all the gods against Troy, contrived an addition which made the issue certain. The priest Laocoon, when the horse was first discovered, had been urgent with the Trojans to destroy it. I fear the Greeks even when they bear gifts, he said. Lacaun and his two sons heard his story with suspicion. The only doubters there. As Sinon finished, suddenly over the sea came two fearful serpents swimming to the land. Once they were there, they glided straight to Lacaun. They wrapped their huge coils around him and the two lads, and they crushed the life out of them. Then they disappeared within Athena's temple. There could be no further hesitation. To the horrified spectators, Lacaun had been punished for opposing the entry of the horse, which most certainly no one else would do now. They dragged the horse through the gates and up to the temple of Athena. Then, rejoicing in their good fortune, believing the war ended and Athena's favor restored to them, they went to their houses in peace as they had not for 10 years. In the middle of the night, the door in the horse opened. One by one, the chieftains let themselves down. They stole to the gates and threw them wide, and into the sleeping town marched the Greek army. What they had first to do could be carried out silently. Fires were started in buildings throughout the city. By the time the Trojans were awake, before they realized what had happened, while they were struggling into their armor, Troy was burning. They rushed out to the street one by one in confusion. Bands of soldiers were bands of soldiers were waiting there to strike each man down before he could join himself to others. It was not fighting, it was butchery. Very many died without ever a chance of dealing a blow in return. In the more distant parts of the town, the Trojans were able to gather together here and there, and then it was the Greeks who suffered. They were borne down by desperate men who wanted only to kill before they were killed. They knew that the one safety for the conquered was to hope for no safety. This spirit often turned the victors into the vanquished. The quickest witted Trojans tore off their own armor and put on that of the dead Greeks. And many a Greek, thinking he was joining friends, discovered too late that they were enemies and paid for his error with his life. On top of the houses, they tore up the roofs and hurled the beams down upon the Greeks. An entire tower standing on the roof of Perim's palace was lifted from its foundations and toppled over. Exulting, the defenders saw it fall and annihilate a great band who were forcing the palace doors. But the success brought only a short respite or the break from the destruction, the war. Others rushed up carrying a huge beam over the debris of the tower and the crushed bodies. They battered the doors with it. It crashed through and the Greeks were in the palace before the Trojans could leave the roof. In the inner courtyard around the altar were the women and children and one man, the old king. Achilles had spared Priam, but Achilles' son struck him down before the eyes of his wife and daughter. By now, the end was near. The contest from the first had been unequal. Too many Trojans had been slaughtered in the first surprise. The Greeks could not be beaten back anywhere. Slowly, the defense ceased. Before morning, all the leaders were dead except one. Aphrodite's son, Aeneas, alone among the Trojan chieftains, escaped. He fought the Greeks as long as he could find a living Trojan to stand with him. But as the slaughter spread and the death came near, he thought of his home, the helpless people he had left there. He could do no, nothing more for Troy, but perhaps something could be done for them. He hurried to them, his old father, his little son, his wife. And as he went, his mother, Aphrodite, appeared to him, urging him on and keeping him safe from the flames and from the Greeks. Even with the goddess's help, he could not save his wife. When they left the house, she got separated from him and was killed. But the other two he brought away through the army, past the city gates, 
out into the country, his father on his shoulders, his son clinging to his hand. No one but a divinity could have saved them. And Aphrodite was the only one of the gods that day who helped a Trojan. She helped Helen too. She got her out of the city and took her Menelaus. He received her gladly. And as he sailed for Greece, she was with him. When morning came, what had been the proudest city in Asia was a fiery ruin. All that was left of Troy was a band of helpless captive women whose husbands were dead, whose children had been taken from them. They were waiting for their masters to carry them overseas to slavery. Chief among the captains was the old queen, Hecuba, and her daughter-in-law, Hector's wife, Andromache. One woman still had her child. Andromache held in her arms her son, Astyanax, the little boy who had once shrunk back from his father's high-crested helmet. He is so young, she thought. They will let me take him with me. But from the Greek camp, a herald came to her and spoke faltering words. He told her that she must not hate him for the news he brought to her against his will. Her son, she broke in, not that he does not go with me. He answered, the boy must die. Be thrown down from the towering wall of Troy. Now, now, let it be done. Endure like a brave woman. Think you are alone. One woman and a slave and no help anywhere. She knew what he said was true. There was no help. She said goodbye to her child. The soldiers carried him away. With the death of Hector's son, Troy's last sacrifice was accomplished. The woman waiting for the ships watched the end. Troy has perished, the great city. Only the red flame now lives there. The dust is rising, spreading out like a great wing of smoke. And all is hidden. We now are gone. One here, one there, and Troy is forever gone. Farewell, dear city. Farewell, my country where my children lived. There below, the Greek ships wait.